Disassociative Identity Disorder. Do you know what this is? You may recognize this as multiple personality syndrome, but in the 1990s, multiple personality syndrome was renamed to Disassociative Identity Disorder. There's a reason for this. Disassociative Identity Disorder has always been considered quite rare, but it may be more common than previously thought, and some estimate it affects 1% of the population. This higher estimated prevalence may be due to the millions of now reported incidences of childhood abuse. Disassociative identity disorder is typically caused by trauma occurring at less than nine years of age. What made me want to do this particular topic of the show was I recently saw an article about disassociative identity disorder or for short, DID. And they were talking about how the research needs to continue in regards to what this disorder is. I was so intrigued by this article that I shared it in a Facebook group. And one of my author friends said, hi, I have DID. And that began what we are talking about today. What's it like to be a Christian who has disassociative identity disorder? Hi, I'm Parker J. Cole, and you're listening to The Parker J. Cole Show. I want to thank my guest co-host and contributor today, Shan Tajia, for being with me. She's going to help us unpack and understand this topic about disassociative identity disorder and help us to correct what maybe the media and lots of entertainment people have caused us to think about it. When we think about DID, we think about movies of people who either have an evil side or a good side. But it's much more nuanced and much more complicated than that. And Shan is with me today to talk about it. Shan, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Feeling a little nervous, but I'm excited to be here. Well, I can't appreciate your nervousness because talking about DID or in general talking about mental illness does have a certain connotation with it. But I see you as an ambassador to break the stereotypes of being afraid to talk about mental illness. And I always go to scripture when it comes to mental illness that the Lord said, those who are sick need a physician. And if your mind is sick, for lack of a better term, it needs a physician as well. And you have a illness, disassociative identity disorder, and many people kind of know about it. They kind of understand it, but they really don't. And that has its own stigma. So I'm really glad that you are here to help us unpack the topic. So before we do that, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am a Minnesota-grown Texan. So I moved to Texas about four years ago. (laughs) And I came down here actually to get away from my family and get away from the environment of where the abuse occurred just because I needed to be able to get distance and be able to heal without that influence in my life anymore. Um, I'm an author. I've written my poetry book, Scraps of Love, and then the Shaloma just released last year. So I'm always busy, always doing things. I've got chickens now, like gardening. There's a lot going on. (laughs) I like the fact that you mentioned that you had to remove yourself from the environment that caused you to be in the situation where you are afflicted with disassociative identity disorder. That's important because when we talk about healing, sometimes you have to remove yourself from the place that caused the trauma. And healing, in my opinion, can be just as difficult as a trauma because as you heal, you have scars that are healing too. And sometimes when you get a scar and it hurts, it kind of throbs a little bit, pus comes out of it, if it's infected, all sorts of things. And the same way, is with trauma of of the mind here. So when did you realize that you had disassociative identity disorder? It was in my early teens. The person that had abused me from childhood until I was about 13 had been released from the home. So my system didn't have a function anymore. And so it became very dysfunctional and I had no idea what was going on. All I knew was that I was hearing things and losing time. And the best at that time of what they could give me for diagnosis was an anxiety disorder because I would have these terrible panic attacks and then I would black out. And I had already had kind of a fascination with what was called MPD at the time. So I was reading everything I could get my hands on 
in our household, we weren't allowed to go to therapy. So that wasn't an option for me. I just really needed to go and find information. So I did a lot of reading and research on childhood sexual abuse, um, narcissistic parents, BPD parents, things like that, just trying to figure out and understand what was happening to me because I didn't have resources like a school counselor or anything like that or anyone to go to. So my sister started mentioning that I would act different at certain times. And then that was when I really started paying attention to what people were telling me about the things that I was doing when I was unaware of what was happening. And it just started to become clear that I wasn't blacking out. I was actually switching to an alternate state. Let's talk about that. And I don't want to, of course, get into your trauma, but as much as talking about how from the research that is coming up is that DID is altered states of your personality. It's not necessarily a separate personality as portrayed in a lot of entertainment and media. It's you at different stages in your life. That's what I'm assuming, but go ahead and correct me. Well, it could also be altered states of what you want to be. So for instance, my protector, Ash, she was, we've integrated since, but she was there to make sure that we were safe. So if anything was happening that I couldn't handle, or any of the other alters couldn't handle, it was her job to get us safe or defend us, even if it was just being sarcastic and things like that. It really can be anything. It can be the age you were at that time. Now they have found that some people have thing, uh, alters called victims. So they're fictional characters that they have adopted into their system. So there's really a lot of different ways that it shows up. Everybody is different. And I think in my personal journey, I have horrible imposter syndrome when it comes to my DID. I was diagnosed officially in 2016, and I thought having a diagnosis would make it a lot easier for me, but it actually kind of made it a lot harder because then I'm looking at other systems and I don't recognize my system in any other system. And I think that's been very damaging to me over the years just because I want to find validation, I guess, in the way these other systems operate, but mine's not like anything I've ever seen. So it gets kind of frustrating. I think even in the DID community, we want to be seen, but even on like the YouTube channels that I watch, it's almost becoming like a parlor trick. Just, you know, to show it and this is me switching and, you know, I want information and I feel like some, in a way, we're kind of trying to entertain, too. And it's not entertaining. It's very life-disrupting. It can, it's a very difficult disorder to live with, especially since you can't really let people close because people are afraid of it and they don't understand it. And if you're in a religious community, like I was raised Pentecostal, so you can imagine what I went through in church because it was perceived as being demonic. Before I get into that part of the topic, I want to go back a little bit. You use certain terminology. I am somewhat familiar with them, but I don't know what the definitions of them are. You said my system, you said my protector ash, you said alters. And for me, I noticed that you said we've recently integrated. So these are things that I don't really understand. And I know our listeners who are listening will want to understand exactly what you mean. So let's go ahead and do some vocabulary real quick. When you mean system, what do you mean by that? So system is all of the alters as a whole in this body. So it's, I think of it kind of like a computer because our minds are kind of like computers and all these different people live in there. They, we have an inner space that's a garden that they live in when they're not out. And our system is just enclosed in this brain, like a little computer program, just little computer programs inside of one person. So now you mentioned alters. What exactly do you mean by alters? So an alter would be the alternate state. So the, the other personality, whatever function it is that they hold, whether they're like, they keep your memories or they're like Ash, they're a protector and they just seek to protect the body and the system from harm. It would just be that what is perceived as a different person or an alternate person. And the terminology really will differ from 
person to person because we all choose how we talk about ourselves. So what I call an alter, someone else might not like that word. They might use a different word. It's just important if you know someone with DID to ask them how they want to be addressed. You also mentioned about you had integrated with Ash, your pro the protector. And what's fascinating to me, and I don't, I don't want to say fascinating like a like a audience thing. It's just fascinating. You said there's still that sense of disassociation with that, like we've integrated. Talk to, talk to me about that. Well, with our integration, I've actually gotten a lot of heat internally with my system because she was the most important alter in our system. And our integration was very accidental. So there is resentment with me being the primary personality and me being the one that's always fronting, always out, things like that, because I'm not as good as she was. <laughs> I don't protect us as well as she did, but that was just, I don't even know how to describe it, but it was being born, essentially. That was how I, I Tajia, was born, was through five different altars as well, including Ash, just having this crazy moment in our mind and our imagination and all of it just fusing into one, which is me. And for a long time, I thought that I was the primary or core personality, but there's that dissociation between that because that's, you know, I have to believe I'm real. I have to believe that I am the primary in order for my system to cor correctly function. Because if it's working properly, not anybody in the system will even know that we are an alter. It's when it gets dysfunctional that it starts getting messy and confusing. So... This leads me to ask you a question, and if this is not something you want to answer, you don't have to. And this is just for information. How do you know Shan is the original you before the trauma? I think that's old thinking. I think the more that we're learning about DID, we're learning that there really is not a core personality because oh, these okay. personalities or altered states are created when we're so young. And some of the research that I've been reading is just that while the mind is developing, a child doesn't have a personality. They have altered states. Like I'm hungry, it, we're all needs based and safety based. And as we start, as we grow and mature, our brain starts to solidify a personality, who we are, and all those things fuse together. But with DID, your brain doesn't have that opportunity because you're always in that stress state. You're always trying to protect yourself in any way. And there's no natural brain development in that because you're in survival mode. One, I mean, if you were in my home, it was 24-7. And there was no saying what was going to happen when. So there was no time to do anything but survive. No time for anything else. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And as you were talking, I actually began to understand what you were saying. Now, let's go into this topic where you said about being a Pentecostal and how it was be a demonic attack. Now, some people have postulated that there is a spiritual element as well as the mental component. I can't speak to anyone else. I don't know anyone who has DID. You're the first person I know who has openly said you have DID. And so I can only ask you about this and see what you say. So tell me, is there a spiritual component? Is it just a disorder? Is there a combination of the two? Go ahead and talk to me and feel free to be as candid as you like. Well, personally, for myself, if there were demons present, I promise you they're gone. <laughs> as many times as I was brought up to an altar to have demons cast out of me. Honestly, that is still something that keeps me from services because it's triggering and trauma inducing for me to, to even go into a church because of what happened. But I do think that it's possible. I think that, I mean, any of us can have demons that attach to us through family history, the things that we allow in our lives. I don't think it's any different for someone that has DID. It just maybe won't be a as obvious that it's demonic but personally i've never met anyone that i've felt or perceived that it was demonic in them so i can't speak to anybody else i could see it happening but i think it's pretty dangerous to be black and white about 
yeah, it's demonic, you know, demonic. I think we, we have to have discernment as believers and we're called to have discernment. So it's important just to feel it out and get to know the person. And if it is revealed to you that they're demonic, you know, there's a demon in action in their system by all, you know, then you have to figure out how you're going to address that with that person. But I don't think it's very common. I think it's just a fear. I know it's my biggest fear. It's one of the things I still worry about every day. You know, is this really happening or am I just crazy or am I possessed? Like it's already there. And to have that stigma on top of all the other stigma that comes into place with the ID and all the misunderstanding, I think that is just so damaging, especially in the church, because we're all broken. We're all there for Amen. salvation and healing and it's not going to do anybody any good if we're putting demons imaginary or whatnot on others while they're struggling with things like this. I am so glad you said that because at the end of the day, particularly for you, since that abuse happened in a church, how have you learned to cling to the Lord when in a way, if I could say it this way, the Lord was used as a way to control and dominate you? It really was just that I know him, I guess, that that even as a child, that was the cry of my heart was there was an old 70s song that says, Abba Father, never let me go. And I used to sing that song to myself when I was scared. And I think he's always honored that prayer. I still sing it to myself, like, don't let me go, no matter how many mistakes I make or all the bad things that happen and the terrible things that have happened, like, please continue to reassure me that I am yours because everything in the world is telling me that I'm not, even your people. And I just think that that desire to be connected to him has, that's the only thing that's kept me going. I mean, I've fallen off the way. I got into witchcraft for a few years. I'm not perfect. I sin. I do all these things. But at the end of the day, I know I see him working in my life. And I know he's working on this disorder and he's helping me to understand it. And he's giving me tools and opportunities. And it's just a feeling like you just know. You know, I'm so glad you said that. And as you said that, literally, I just felt this tingle go through me. And for our listeners, we're recording and she can see me. And I kind of just jumped up when <laughs> I did it. Because she just said, because I know him. And I just, I just, oh, it went through me, you know, no matter what Satan can throw at you in this sense, it'll be the outside influences that cause you to be in this predicament, no matter what he threw at you, I know him that will preach, Shan, that will preach. And people love to use that verse, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You've actually lived that you, you've lived in this thing that has altered you. But guess what? God is still in control, you know, and he's, like you said, like I said, he's working through you and he's working with you. And he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Behold, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. And that's my favorite verse because I hate being alone. That's one of my fears to be alone. One of my greatest fears during 2020 when everyone was locked down and me and my husband had split at the time and I was by myself. There was no one here. I was going crazy, but I was alone. And during that time, I found out something about myself. I sometimes use people to block out thinking about things that I probably should think about, but there was no one else there. <laughs> <laughs> so guess what I talked to? It was just me and the Lord. There was no one else there. And then we couldn't go to church because of the pandemic. And I'm sorry, I am not a good virtual member, okay? I'm not going to sit here and look at you preach. I need to be in front of you. I need to be around the saints and stuff like that. But guess what? I end up doing, what, more devotion. I end up having private conversations. I got closer and closer. And I'll never forget when I was walking my dog, because she was the only thing with me. I was walking my dog, and I mentioned this before on the show, so my listeners, if you're tired of hearing the story, I'm sorry. But I was walking my dog, Shan, and... I had walked the furthest I had ever walked and I was feeling really proud of myself. And this lady drove up, she was like, miss, I'm just gonna let you know, there are three loose, loose pit bulls back there. And I was like, oh my gosh, there are, <laughs> you know, cause I was gonna just turn and walk away. And so I said, well, I can't go back that way. And I had to walk even further to get back home cause who wants to get mauled by a dog, right? All of a sudden I said, God of the universe, 
cared enough about me to bring this woman, some random woman, to tell me about three loose dogs where I had just walked. I just walked that way. And it made me fall like a baby. I could not stop crying because I was so grateful that here in the midst of my loneliness, I wasn't alone. And that just resonates with me, which is story just said, because I know him, you know, and I called him when I was scared and I called him when all, you know, and the Lord said, I hear you. He says, I don't, he's not this distant God, like in the Greek mythology, which I love. I love Greek mythology. I love all the myths and folklore. He said, but he's not some distant God playing around on chessboards like we're pawns. He is actively in our lives. And that just resonates me. In the little moments. I love that, Shan. I mean, I am just, if you could touch my face right now, it's boiling hot because I'm just resonating with your words. And that can just preach all on its own. But one thing you said too, we want to kind of make, we want to make sure that if we are going to have any type of conversation about DID, we need to understand what it is. And for what I've talked to you about today, you said it is not multiple personalities. It's alter states of personality. You mentioned that for a normal child who doesn't have a lot of trauma, what is happening is that your personality coalesces as you get older and then you start to say, okay, this is PJ, right? But when you're in a state of trauma, your, your, your personalities don't all come together. You're in survival mode. I'm hungry. I need to survive. And so these personalities don't get a chance. These states of uh, personality don't get a chance to coalesce. And so they come alters. You mentioned about the system where people who have DID, they have a system, kind of like a computer, where all the personalities exist, which actually makes sense because they haven't coalesced. You recently mentioned about your own integration with one of your personalities where you came out as the forefront primary personality and all the alters were upset. Now, one thing I did want you to kind of go into is having the experience of being someone who has DID. And you mentioned about hearing voices and at the time you didn't know what it was. So when you hear voices, like right now you're sitting and if you heard a voice, it will be completely separate from you. It will be next to your ear. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. And it's feels, I know that it's in my head, but it feels in and out at the same time. That's when you're co-conscious with, and sometimes that happens where Alters will come closer to the front being like being out and then you can hear them or they can see what's going on. For me, it was, I always had them going at the same time. So my mom, I remember when one day I was in the bedroom and I was watching TV and reading a book and listening to the radio and singing a different song that wasn't playing on anything else. And my mom came in my room and she's like, what are you doing? And I was like, just told her, you know, this is all the stuff I'm doing. And she's like, how can you even focus on that? And I think that was kind of the moment that I realized that my brain was a little bit different because we talk about a part of me wants to do this, but a part of me wants to do that. That's like normal conversation that we have as humans, because we do have multiple ideas or conflicting emotions about things and situations. So when everyone was talking about that, I thought that's just what it meant, that they all, everyone had a, this chatter in their head all the time, telling them what to do or having monologues about whatever is going on or anything like that. I thought that was normal because that's the way we talk. Part of me wants to do this, but a part of me wants to do that. And I think that was the moment when I really started thinking, you mean everyone can't do five things at once that are completely different? Because what was happening was each voice at that time was what I called them was doing something different and we were all co-conscious in that moment we were all out and enjoying our lives now one of the things about DID that differentiates it from other dissociative disorders in the spectrum is that there is an amnesia barrier and that's what makes DID different in that the the alters will not remember what the other alters are doing. So I switch still, but I do not know that I'm switching and I, I'm never aware of what the other alter is doing. So we have rules that we have to have in order to have a job and have a life. 
but that is the difference because there are as a big spectrum of DID or not DID, but dissociative disorders. So that is the one thing that makes that much different is that there is an amnesia barrier between the personalities. If I may, I want to go to Hollywood really quickly. There is a movie that um, one of my favorite actors played in, uh, John Cusack, John Cusack. And it was called Identity. It was back in the 19, probably 97, something like that. And it starts off, it was really, it was a really good movie, but then you find out that it's this guy who's a criminal who had uh, killed all these people, but you had no idea that all these people were really him. You had no idea. And when John Cusack comes to consciousness in this guy's body, he looks at himself and he looks completely different than, you know, uh, John Cusack, you know, the... Yeah, what he perceives himself as. Yeah. And so he's like, what do you mean? He said, you're in a body and because it was the whole thing was that each they were dying. These these personalities were dying. And as they died, a room key from this hotel will fall down and that'll be the death of this personality. And the psychiatrist on the outside of what was happening was saying that this guy has DID. It is not his fault, but this dominant personality has to die. That's what he was saying. This dominant personality that's killing people has to die. That's how they portrayed it. And blah, blah, crap happens. And I'm sorry, that's how I always say it when I don't want to go into a whole movie. <laughs> blah, blah, crap happens. And so at the end, John Cusack kills the guy, the personality that's real crazy because they all had the same. No, it was so crazy because they all had the same birthday. It, it was just really interesting how they did. I actually think you probably may enjoy the movie because it's a really that's good movie. actually one of my favorite movies. <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I watched real. that movie like four times because the storytelling is just excellent. But and at the end, so since you've seen it, and then you find out they needed this twist ending that I hated. I was like, I hate this twist ending. How come he can't be healed? You know what I mean? <laughs> Why can't she be in there with the oranges and growing a garden? You know what I'm saying? But I was thinking, like, if you were to rate, I, you know, DID portrayals, would that be a good one or a bad one or neutral? What do you think? I think that movie is excellent storytelling, like you said, but... The idea that everybody who has DID has this evil personality that's out to either hurt each other or others, I think is pretty erroneous. The system is built to survive. It's not built to call attention to itself or hurt others. It's about protecting that person. So I do have what we call a persecutor altar. But that person, I call her shenanigans because she's usually up to mischief. That altar is not there to hurt anyone, but she will cause trouble for me if she feels that I'm doing something that isn't safe for us. For instance, when I was in therapy, my therapist would give me homework and we tried every which way to make sure that I could remember because I could remember that she told me to do something. And then it was important for our next meeting to talk about. But if I kept a journal, the journal would disappear. The pages would disappear. Things would get misplaced. If there was an email, it would get deleted forever. So that was about her protecting me from delving into whatever that topic was, whether it was actually talking about the trauma or any subject that the system was uncomfortable with. Now, a persecutor alter... I don't think of them as protectors. The protectors are the ones that are going to protect you from others. But again, you're not going to find a protector instigating anything or attacking anybody. And I don't know what they were trying to portray with that movie with them saying, you know, we have to kill, kill the bad altar. Because I don't think that's correct either. <laughs> it's just, it's such a good movie. I have such conflicting emotions about it because I remember that moment when the therapist stood up at that table and he's like, it's not his fault. He has he has dissociative identity disorder. And that was the first time in media that I had actually heard them use the proper term. Because even now you still hear people talk, well, I must have multiple personalities or I must have MPD. And it's not that. And even I think the definition of MPD from what it was then to what we now understand as DID is so vastly different because there has been a lot more research over the years. Um, so I just, I don't know. I don't think that it's plausible. I think it makes for really good storytelling. And I think of all the DID movies, that one probably is most intricate 
that I've seen, but yeah, I don't think it's a really good representation. It's not the worst representation, but it's, it's definitely not the best either. You know, Shan, you've been very courageous during all this. How do you feel now that you've talked about this? How are you feeling about it? Like, how do you feel? Well, honestly, I, right now I'm kind of disconnected from my feelings. This is something that I've only told a few um, in my circle. It's never something that is handled very well. People don't understand it, so they are scared of it. So you either get treated like you're fragile or like you're possessed or they just are too scared of it to even, you know, they'll distance themselves from you. So it's, I'm kind of disconnected from it just because I am afraid of backlash. I've lost friends over this before and I'm only now, I mean, I'm almost 40 years old and I'm, I still have never told my trauma story to anybody, not even my therapist. And I'm just now learning to tell my story. So that was one of the reasons I was so excited to answer your message was just because, you know, I'm safe. I mean, I'm in a much better place now than I was four years ago when I left. And the people that were controlling me and using my DID as a means of controlling me aren't able to do that anymore. And it's just really time to start talking about it. So I'm really happy that you invited me to come. You know, I got to be honest with you. I can't see why someone would stop being friends with you. Clearly, once they begin to understand, like, it's not your fault. This isn't something you signed up for. It's not like you said, I want to have this happen to me. And I think, too, how glad I am that you're being so candid and just letting us know, hey, this is what it's like. And you're giving us the nuances of this disorder. You approach it from the whole spiritual angle, too. You talk about how Christ is still in control. And it's just good to hear. And first of all, next thing, too, you don't look 40, by the way. Young lady. <laughs> you do not look 40. OK, well, thank so you. I'm jealous. I'm jealous. <laughs> I thought you were like 26 to 27. Like, oh, OK, you know, and now I'm jealous. You know, but thanks a lot, Shan. Now I feel inadequate. <laughs> but, um, no. But no. <laughs> but no, I'm just, you know, I'm, I can't tell you just how glad I am that I've had the opportunity to talk to you. And I can't tell you how how good it makes me feel that our listeners are going to get a better understanding of something that's very mystical, almost, you know, it's like a mystical thing. And I hope those who are listening who have DID find hope and find help in some of the things that you said, particularly as you learn to deal with this disorder and as it contains itself. Well, is that the right word I want to use? As As you learn to contain it, you know. So, yeah, Shan, I just want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with me on the show today. We will be having you back because we want to highlight your book, too. So we're going to have you back for the right stuff. This is the Saturday (laughs) show, the Parker J. Cole show. But we're going to have you back, too. I just want to thank you so much for being with me on the show and can't wait to have you back and have you back real soon. Thank you, Parker. I'm really happy I came, like I said. And I really am appreciative of the opportunity to talk a little bit about this. I guess the most important thing is just to remember that everybody's different. And if you love somebody, you can love everybody in their system. And even if you have somebody who is in your life that has DID, you can find resources online and you can find support online. There's a lot of really good groups out there for people with DID and families and loved ones of people with DID. Because it gets complicated and it gets messy and confusing and frustrating. I mean, I can't imagine what it's like for my sister to deal with me sometimes. And for me to not know what's going on and the frustration of, you know, her having to repeat herself or tell me things that I did. And, you know, there's a side, there's both sides to it. It's not just the person that has DID that has to cope with the madness, (laughs) that for lack of a better word, like just the chaos sometimes that happens with this disorder, but there really is hope and you just have to find a way to work it out and get communication with your system or figure out a way to function because there is a way to have a normal, healthy life and normal, healthy relationships with people. You just have to figure it out. And if you don't mind, let's go ahead and I'll have you pray for us today. Father, I thank you for this opportunity. Something that 
I never thought I would have. And the, the doors that you've opened for me, just in my willingness to be able to be a voice for you and being open to the different paths that you would like to take me. Father, I know that you have those same plans and intentions for anyone who has mental illness, whether it's DID or any other disorder that's out there, that you have a way of making everything beautiful and you have a way of lifting up people even from the darkest places. And I just pray that you will minister to those that are listening today that if they need the su- need support or they need help, Father, that you will begin to move those things into their lives so that they can begin to heal and deal with the things that the world has meant for evil so that they have the opportunity to make it for the glory of your kingdom. I just ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Shan, thank you for that lovely prayer. And to our listeners out there, we were talking about disassociative identity disorder from a Christian perspective. And I want to thank Shan just for her candidness, her frankness. I learned a lot today, and I hope you did too. And if you want to get more information, make sure you go ahead and do some research about it. If you have a loved one who has DID, there are resources available for you. And if you have DID, Shan is an example that you can have a healthy lifestyle with healthy relationships, you got to get help. And there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of the Parker J. Cole Show. You have a wonderful, absolutely glorious blessed day. And God bless.